Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you have joined us. We're here to talk plants and maybe hear about some of the trials or, or opportunities in your garden and help you out. So that's what our plan is for today. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, College of Aces. Okay, let's find out who the intelligent people are next to me. <laughs> there are three of them. Let's find out who they are. And we're gonna go first to Dr. Bob Skirvin. Hi, Bob. Hello, nice to see you again. Nice to be here. So I teach horticulture and my specialty is fruits and grapes and wine and blackberries, stuff like that. Anyway, what I brought in today is something that maybe you see in the grocery store, maybe you haven't seen the grocery store, but you didn't know what it was, but I scared you in the grocery store. <laughs> and this thing right here, it looks kind of, I don't know, it looks like a turnip or anything, you know, it looks really odd. Anyway, it's called a dragon fruit. And the dragon fruit is really kind of interesting. The most interesting thing about it is when you cut it open, inside it looks like it's full of ants. And it's got zillions of seeds in there. And then the part, the part you eat, of course, you cut out this. It's so soft. It's soft. Uh, really quite good. Kind of odd more, more than anything. <laughs> are the seeds crunchy? And the seeds are a little crunchy, but not, but not, not very much. They're kind of there. And where I've seen this most often is when you go to a real fancy party, they have a fruit fruit bar across. They'll have some of this here. People, people don't eat it because they don't know if it's edible. But that's a, this. Now what this actually is, this plant, it's a night blooming cereus. It's a cactus. And how do you spell cereus? C-E-R-E-U-S. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, it's the one yeah, we use as a plant in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the fruit of that thing. And the first time I saw it, my, my son lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and they have a whole bunch of cactus in the yard, and they have these things, and the, the cactus in bloom is the fruits to make is it just looks just like this, and the birds always just come in like, man, they love it. So I was, for quite several days, I fought the birds to try to get one so I could see what it tasted like. And I got a little one, and that little one, I cut it open, and it's just that, just like that, and it's smaller, and the birds like it real well. Night blooming cereus, they call it dragon fruit. They're from, uh, I think these are from Vietnam and they fly them in. And so give it a go, it's something really different. Nothing else is beautiful. Do you think it's because it's gray is why people might, it does look somewhat gray. I know, I know. It's, it's really just an odd fruit. I was taking, taking it into my classes, the students, and the students, some, some wouldn't even get close to it. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's so soft like that, you have to try it. Oh, thank you for bringing yeah, that you in. Can, you can all try it soon, we'll pass it around. Okay, anyway. we'll wait until later so we don't have black things. <laughs> In, in our, our teeth. teeth. Okay. You don't want ants in your teeth. <laughs> no, we don't. Thank you, Bob. Okay. And now let's go to the man in the middle, Dr. Stephen Still. Uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, yes, I'm Steve Still. I'm a professor emeritus from Ohio State University, uh, where I taught landscape horticulture. And I'm also executive director of the Perennial Plant Association, which is a really a worldwide uh, group of growers, mm -hmm. retailers, designers that professionally uh, work in the perennial industry. And, uh, but even, although I'm Ohio State, I do have three degrees from the University of Illinois. Yay. So I, I call this area home. I have a, uh, a question here and it's on mugwort. And the, the question was, our newest problems is mugwort. It has roots similar to Can Canadian thistle and bindweed, tips on controlling it. And I'm sorry, I don't have a, a great amount of super information to uh, 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 limit your uh, problem. But uh, this is Artemisia vulgaris, it, sometimes called chrysanthemum weed because it does look like a chrysanthemum, or mugwort. It's the big thing as indicated with Canadian thistle or bindweed, it has rhizomes and they spread continuously. So control measures, well, we can do manual and one way would be to continuous removal of the uh, top vegetation. Obviously the roots are still there, it is a perennial. Basically this would starve the uh, rhizomes uh, from photosynthetic uh, nutrients, but you have to do that on a continuous uh, basis. Next thing, you might try covering the uh, mugwort uh, with a thick uh, cardboard and then with three or four inches of mulch over the top of that. Again, you're smothering the uh, uh, vegetation that might be coming up and eventually, hopefully, re reducing the uh, rhizome uh, production. Uh, chemical control, and not all of us want to uh, try that, but uh, uh, you can use Roundup probably in the, the late fall and then again in the, or late spring and then again in the fall. This is uh, 
poke both the uh, things like uh, cardboard and uh, Roundup are difficult if it's an established bed. You know, you know how are you going to, to do that? Uh, so all these work on a limited extent. Uh, the biggest caution, do not till, as this simply slices the rhizomes into many pieces, and typically each piece can create a new plant. So you're really at, back to square one if you do that. I was just visualizing that. That would be really a mess. So very good, and that was a good question uh, from Jane as well. Thank you, Stephen. And now let's go to Dr. Don White. Yes, I'm Dr. Don White. <laughs> Emeritus Professor of Plant mm -hmm. Pathology from the University of Illinois. And while at the University of Illinois, I taught introductory plant pathology. Very well. A number mm -hmm. of people have well. my class. Mm -hmm. Diseases of field crops and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses. And did research on corn. Uh, I guess I saw the light later on and became, <laughs> after retirement, I became a master gardener. And that's been very enjoyable for me. And tonight, I have so this is foliar nematode on hosta. A nematode is a parasitic uh, worm, and they suck the nutrients out of the cells, and eventually they'll kill the cells. They move very well in soft tissue, but what happens, they hit the veins, and they have trouble getting across the vein tissue. So that's the reason why you got lesions that are very long and slender. And these things are not real common. But here, I, this is a microscope view of the torn up the leaf, and you can see the little worms sticking their heads out and kind of <laughs> trawling. They're trying to get out of the way is what they're trying to do. And here's one he's all curled around. Generally speaking, they don't do very well in the winter. And But what we do have, there is a lot of difference in susceptibility of varieties. But the problem is that it, the breeding on hosta is very unclear. You try to find out what the parents are, and uh, there's so many people that have done hosta breeding and haven't kept very good records. Oh boy. So, you know. Yeah, well, if they, so it's not very common, but they should be aware of it. Yes, should be aware of it, and I'd like to see more of it, because this is one way to show little kids what a nematode looks like. Oh, these plant pathologists, <laughs> what to do with them. What to do with them. Okay, very good. Well, we're starting to get a lot of phone calls, so we might have to go to that. And I'm not surprised that the first one's about Japanese uh -huh. beetles. Let's go to line two with Mary. Hi, Mary. Hello. I have a real big problem with uh, the Japanese beetles. It looks like they have bred with June bugs. They're coming out of the soil in my garden. They, it's just like a honeybee. There are that many of them, and just they're huge. They're probably twice the size of a June bug. It's, it's a big one. Huh? The, I have the little, the little ones. ones are, there's, there's, some, there's some that are about double size. I've got some in my yard too. Really? And I have the other ones, so. I but it's just, it's two different at, subspecies? Part, I've always called, when we had them out the, at the farm, when we had, had grapes and raspberries and stuff like that out at the farm, then they, they can make it both kinds. They come in and they just chop down the plant. They, they love them. So. But there's some, there's some that are really big. They're, kind of really, they're pretty, pretty. It'd be nice for an insect collection. Yeah, they're pretty as I drop them into a little bit of soapy water. Yeah, the little, little, <laughs> little one of the regular ones, I've seen those, but the big ones I saw today. Huh, no, I had not seen the big ones today. But it's no different in control, which is hard to control. It's really a prolific year, at least what I have seen. So so there's nothing different about that one, though. Correct, Bob? You just... Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not an entomologist. Yeah. I don't know. But. None of us are, but I think from having seen it <coughs> helps us. Uh, but yes, there is a big one. But I have the small ones, and most of them I've seen are the smaller ones. And we just need to be glad when they're gone. They don't stay forever. Is it six weeks or so? It's well, they're always moving is the problem. You get a population yeah. that comes in, and then three days later they move, but they're replaced by another population. Yeah. And it's a long, so. it's a long time, it seems, but it's not the whole summer. So and don't use traps. <laughs> no. That, thank Unless you. you put them in your neighbor's yard, and <laughs> you don't like the neighbor. But you will, the, you will bring them in. You'll bring them in. They, they smell the pheromones that they're in there mm -hmm. to trap them. It's, oh boy, I got a big, big <laughs> orgy going next door. And they all come yeah. in, all the friends, and they, everybody brings me. It's a terrible, a terrible problem. Yeah. 
So I like the soapy water method, but it, it gets a hundredth of them at least <laughs> this year. Last year was pretty uh, nice. You need a lot of grandkids to pick them off. Oh, <laughs> and uh, chickens. <laughs> when we had chickens, we always had, they loved them, of course. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? But, of course, be a pretty big bite. Japanese beetles were always at the top of plants, and chickens are not that Chickens tall. can't fly? So you just... His lips? Bapping. <laughs> okay, he's giving chicken <laughs> chicken jokes over here. Well, let's move right along there, but thank you very much for that question, Mary. And let's go to Jean's question on line three about blossom in rot. Hi there, Jean. Hi. I want to know the best treatment for blossom in rot. We seem to have this problem every year. Okay, usually what happens on blossom in rot uh, is because you got too much fertilizer, too much nitrogen, you get an irregular growth, uh, the, the blossom ends, splits and cracks, the fungi get in, and then you end up with that black discoloration. Tomatoes, you just need a rich garden soil and no nitrogen fertilizer. Repeat after me, no nitrogen <laughs> fertilizer. Don't, you don't need to push them, and it's, a lot of times it's the nitrogen fertilizer is the problem. Also, what you got to watch is irregular water because anything that creates irregular growth and causes mm -hmm. those cracking, then the fungi get in and mm -hmm. got a problem. And while you're at it, you might just go ahead and mulch them when you plant them. Yep. And that does help to make the water a little bit more even. But this year, we, I'm sure everyone's had to water. But I just hope. do it in a way that it's uniform, even. Okay, thank you for answering the blossom in rock question. I think we might hear more of that. Okay, now Linda is on line four and she has a question about weed barriers. Hi, Linda. Hi, thank you for taking my question. You're welcome. Uh, my husband passed away last summer and he was a prolific vegetable gardener. And I don't have the skills that he had and the garden got grown up in weeds and we cut it all down to the bare ground and uh, I had a plan to spray it with something like Roundup to keep the weeds from coming back and then put a weed barrier down. And I wanted to know if that's the right thing to do. And then I would also like late in the fall to plant grass in that area so that uh, we have a nice grass in the spring. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know what kind of a grass uh, would be recommended. It's a, a completely sunny area. Okay. All right, who wants to dig in on a three, several faceted question? Well, the, first of all, uh, if, if it's down to clean cultivation with the cutting it back, you might want, first of all, leave that to grow some because uh, the Roundup needs to have foliage to uh, uh, develop and to spray it on the leaves to translocate to the roots. But uh, a weed barrier, again, that could be a cardboard or something like that. Uh, dark plastic uh, mm -hmm. would work as well to reduce that. And then uh, hopefully that would kill all the uh, perennial roots. And then uh, I'm not sure in what grass in this area, but if it's a lawn grass, uh, the uh, uh, perhaps bluegrass or the tall fescue type of mixes uh, mm -hmm. would be something you might put in that area. Full sun is the easiest. It's the shady grasses that are difficult. So, yeah, I think you answered all of it. So everyone's just saying Good. thank you. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to Sharon's question. She's on line five. It's about butterfly milkweed. Hi, Sharon. Hi, um, I'll ask that at the end if you don't mind, Diane. A couple weeks ago, you had a program on it, and I think the lady was talking in reference to hydrangeas. But regardless of what it is, when you clip them, I learned this from a little old lady, 93 years old, lived across from me in Portsmouth, Virginia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get Elmer's glue, and every time you clip the ends, especially roses, put a dab of glue on them, and it prevents any vermin, especially boll weevils. The flowers will come out, but they'll stay hard as a rock. They won't bloom. And that's what it was there in that area anyway. And what they were describing was the flowers would come out and they wouldn't bloom, they'd just stay hard and then fall off. And that's what it was. And ever since then, I've done that with everything that I clip. I have my Elmer's glue handy, so. Well, I've never heard of that tip. And your neighbor lady did it. 
and that's how you learned it. Well, that's interesting. We learn a lot from our viewers. That's very interesting. Okay, now let's go to line six, Kathy's question. And it looks like Rose of Sharon, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, number one, um, Japanese beetles love Virginia creeper. <laughs> oh, yeah. Leave it, and it'll leave everything else along. But um, good, good tip. I, I really need to ask you about when I should be pruning my Rosa Sharon's. I think I did a little bit too early, and some of them aren't blooming. So when do I, when do, I do it? I mean, they don't stop blooming usually. When did you prune them? Um, hmm. It was probably early in the spring, very early in the spring before anything started budding out or anything. Okay, I think that's the tip. Who would okay. like to who would like to answer that? Uh, the answer again was uh, pruning in the the spring, basically pruning off many of the flower buds that would be developing. Uh, Rose of Sharon is a summer flowering type of plant, so the best thing would be after it's finished. Uh, uh, in the, the midsummer, so prune back at that time if you need to, to do that. That allows the uh, uh, flower or the stems to develop the flowering buds for next year. And it's just a good rule of thumb for anything. Whenever it flowers, you prune it after it flowers. Wow. And so lilac, deadhead or prune after it, Rose of Sharon. Because when it's hot, I think that's why people don't do it. <laughs> it might be a little too hot. Well, you say in fruit production, you wait until after you get your fruit. Exactly. It's so the same. It's the same principle. When you, you get your reward, yeah, you know, flower you, or when fruit. When you grew the plant for you, let it do that job, then you prune it. Yeah. But you don't wait because then you're pruning off some of your reward right. that's already year. forming. Very good. Gosh, we should all be teachers. <laughs> oh, wait. We are all teachers. Okay. Well, we're going to go uh, back to the panel and let's have you go another round. Is this uh, an email, Bob? Uh, what this is an got? email okay. on raspberries. And, uh, and Je Jessica wrote in and said that that she's up, been offered some free raspberry plants. And so it's a red raspberry plants, and then she wants to know if you can plant the red raspberry plants by the blackberry, because she's heard that the black raspberries will, will kill them. Anyway, so here, here's the deal. Now, first of all, the best thing to do is buy some f clean, virus-free plants. And so t tell your friends that you really appreciate the thought of giving you some free plants, but they're full of viruses, and you're better off to go, go back to zero. Go, go to a company that ever has virus-free plants, buy some, plant them in the springtime. And if you do it right, some of the fall berry and raspberries you plant those, you'll have raspberries that fall as you plant them. It's really very impressive. Now, the other thing is that uh, with the case of raspberries is black raspberries are very sensitive to viruses. And we, we say if you do want to plant red raspberries and black raspberries and blackberries and all, did you plant the black raspberries quite a ways away from the others because the virus will kill them. Red raspberries are quite tolerant. Blackberries are quite tolerant. They do better when they're clean. But no, it's not, not much of a problem, really. But the best advice, honest to God, the best advice is buy some clean plants and start from zero. You'll be better off. You'll be glad you did for the last uh, lot, lot, lot more years of raspberry production. That's what I would do. Okay. Thank you very much, Bob. And now, Stephen, let's go to you. I have uh, also another uh, email uh, question. It's on lilac leaf. And this is from Trish. And it says, this little tree is entering its third year. Each spring, new leaves develop and within a day or two turn black and fall off. Uh, and uh, what basically what is the, the problem. She does fertilize with fish emulsion in the spring, uh, that type of thing. Uh, it's always sometimes difficult to diagnose what is happening with the a plant, but uh, my uh, thought would be that it's probably a bacterial blight that's a quite, quite common on uh, lilac. We probably should have had Don uh, answer the, from the expert side, but uh, basically uh, it often happens in cool, wet uh, springs. And I'm, since I'm not from this area, I might guess that for the last three years there's been cool, wet springs where the yes. uh, bacterial blight uh, would develop. It's a very difficult type of uh, problem to uh, control. Mostly it's a cultural uh, feature. If you do see that uh, uh, development of the uh, leaves that look like you put a blowtorch to them and they're scorched, is to prune them uh, back, to destroy them. Uh, don't put them in the compost pile, but uh, maybe wrap them in 
uh, plastic or something like that, and uh, always sterilize your uh, pruning shears between each cut so you're not spreading the bacterial blight to the, the next Yeah, uh, take thing. away with alcohol or bleach, yeah, ble bleach mm -hmm. water or something with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep your tools clean. So I'm guessing that that's probably the major uh, problem uh, with this. Uh, and then uh, also bacterial blight is more uh, uh, susceptible to high fertility rates as well. Okay, very good. Thank you, because we love our lilacs. <laughs> okay, now Don. Yes, I've got a show and tell. This is uh, juniper tip blight, or AKA uh, juniper uh, tip blight of red cedar is caused by the fungus Fomopsis. This is a disease of young tender tissue. It occurs in wet springs. Basically what happens, the fungus survives in dead uh, needle tissue uh, it produces spores and they're spread by splashing. The fungus then penetrates and it grows in the, usually the new growth. This one right here got hit in whole, all bunches of new growth. This uh, disease uh, can be controlled several different ways. A lot of the things you read will say, well, to prune off the dead stuff, that does not work hardly at all. Because you've always got dead needles back in, in there somewhere and so there was some really nice studies that were done at uh, University of Illinois in the late 60s, early 70s at the Natural History Survey, and they couldn't show an effect. But everybody just puts that in their, their literature. Uh, you do get a lot of variation in genetic susceptibility, and there's a number of uh, some, like the blue rug juniper types mm -hmm. that are fairly resistant. There's others that are not resistant at all. What you also have is you want to plant junipers where? Sunny locations. Mm -hmm. You don't plant them in shade where the water's going to stay on the foliage. That gives the fungus a little bit of a mm -hmm. help. Very good. That's interesting because you want to just prune it off. You think, oh, that's I know, good. intuitively, mm -hmm. but it even survives on uh, bark tissue. Oh, okay. <laughs> not a chance then. You know, plant okay. pathologists, we get all excited when we find the fungus where it's not <laughs> supposed to be, so. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. so listen up. So not suscept susceptible varieties. That sounds good. Well, let's go back to the phone lines, and Sandra has a question on line two for us. Hi there, Sandra. Hi, Diane. My daughter asked me to ask you uh, about hydrangeas, They've, uh, Annabelle hydrangeas. Okay. They've been doing very well, blooming well, until the last three years, and they don't get any blooms. And I asked her if, she had, if they had more shade, and she said no. Oh, that was what I was going to ask. <laughs> okay. So the last three years... Could it, I mean, it bloomed before, could it be too, planted too deep or, wow. Has she been pruning them? For several years, they bloomed, there, there are several of them. And yes, how has she pruned them? Do you, do you have any idea? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Her husband, Mike, would be doing the, plume, the pruning. So I wonder if he, you know, maybe it just needs to be deadheaded. They might try that and yeah. not really prune for the next year, so just, Anything that's brown, just pinch that or, you know, pull that off, but don't touch anything else. Even if it's not a perfect shape, maybe it's getting pruned. You know, the new buds. Just no flowers. Yeah, I think yeah. they're getting probably pruned out. Yeah. I'm it's the husband's fault, of course. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> but if there's no flowers, then tell him not to do anything for one year. And it can be an ex yeah. um, experiment, and it might be the thing. Mm. That's the beauty of Annabelle. You really don't have to do anything <laughs> to it, except sometimes the flowers get so heavy. They fall over. They fall over. So, but anyway. Can I ask a quick question from Dr. Spill? Sure. I want to be reminded what the perennial plant of the year is. Oh, good question. Yes, thanks for asking that. It is butterfly weed, uh, which is, uh, if you want to impress your friends at cookouts, it's Asclepius tuberosa. Uh, but butterfly weed and coming driving over from Columbus to, to here that yesterday I could see the butterfly weed along the roadside cuts and stuff. It's and beautiful right now. It's the most beautiful Illini orange. <laughs> it's really, really pretty and insects just love it. It's a really good pollinator plant. So I think it's one of the better choices. I have uh, always. It, all the it. clouds or whatever came together at the same time oh. to create the uh, pollinator uh, Year it's, and stuff. It's totally drought resistant. It's once you get it established, it's now the only time I've had trouble is I think the uh, 
monarch butterfly larva actually did one of my plants <laughs> in, but that's a good problem in my book. <laughs> that's a good problem. Well, so anyway, that was a good question. And um, what was last year's? Because we've got just a moment to fill. What was last year's perennial plant of the year? Am I asking a question? Oh, that, wow. Was it anemone? <laughs> was it the fall anemone last year? Or was that two years? But can I give a plug? You can yeah. go on and see all of the perennial plant mm. of the year. Just PPA? The perennialplant.org. Perennialplant.org. And you, since 1990, because I used to teach all of them. So that's really fun. Thank you three for being on. This has been really informative. Thank you for all your questions out there. We hope that you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Bye-bye.